Welcome to the Funding Partners Press Conference for the 2023 Latin America Amateur Championship. I'll begin this morning by introducing our panel. On the far left is Mr. Martin Slumbers, Chief Executive of the RNA. In the center is Mr. Mike Juan, CEO of the United States Golf Association. And on the right hand side is Mr. Fred Ridley, Chairman of the Masters Tournament. I'd now like to hand over to Mr. Juan to make uh, some opening remarks and uh, two important announcements this morning. Mike. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Well, on behalf of the RNA, uh, the Masters Tournament, and the USGA, I just want to say uh, welcome to the eighth playing of the Latin American Amateur Championship. There's so many organizations, people, associations that all take place behind the scenes that, uh, that really make this championship special. But I think on behalf of the three of us, I'd just like to say this morning that you, the people looking at us, and not the other way around, have truly made this, uh, this important and special as well. See, it's, it's you that tell the story of these athletes. It's you that tell the stories of the countries and the territories they come from. And you're helping us uh, make these young athletes the heroes that other young athletes want to aspire to follow. So whether you're in the room, watching us streaming, or writing your stories from home in the new world of teams, um, thank you for bringing the Latin America uh, Amateur Championship to life. We, um, we built this championship to inspire and grow the game in the Latin American region. And at some point this week, I hope that you as, as individual media supporters will take a little bit of time to celebrate and appreciate uh, what this championship means, what it's meant, and this journey that we're on together. On a very personal note, I'm really excited to be here, uh, Puerto Rico and the Grand Reserve. Unfortunately, in COVID times, my turn for COVID was April of last year, the exact time that we were playing the women's amateur four ball here at the USGA. And so while this is the first time for the Latin American championship here in Puerto Rico, for the USGA, we were here just a year ago, but it was minus Mike Juan. So I'm really excited to be here and be part of this championship. Um, I don't know if you realize this, Chairman Ridley, but when we played the women's amateur four ball here on the last day and the last match of the four women that teed off, two of them were 2018 national finalists at Augusta National. So when you watch that on TV with, uh, with wet eyes like the rest of us and you wonder, what happens to those great young champions? Well, they go on to win more championships and, um, and a couple of them were here in Puerto Rico just a year ago. Uh, on behalf of all of us that you see and a lot that you don't, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you to the Puerto Rican Golf Association uh, and to our friend and peer, Sidney Wolf. I'm not sure what it'll say the day that Sidney leaves us on that tombstone, but I hope it says, here lies one of golf's best friends because he has been both to me and to this organization. And then um, for all of us that are gonna get to witness these athletes on this great stage, I just wanna say to Jason Matos, who's the golf superintendent, um, my group at the USGA spends a lot of time with a lot of golf supers. I've rarely heard the compliments out of their mouth like I heard all week this week. So thank you to that as well. So my father used to always say to me, give it to me and give it to me by the numbers, which I think was his way of saying, I don't have time for a Mike one and now you're realizing why, but he'd say, give it to me by the numbers. So I'm gonna give it to you by the numbers. 193 countries will be, paid, will be uh, participating in watching this event over the next four days. Athletes from 108 countries, uh, 108 athletes from 28 countries nine of which come from Puerto Rico, our, our highest represented uh, region, eight from Argentina, eight from Brazil, eight from Colombia. 31 players are playing for the very first time here, and they age from age 15 to 54. 58 colleges and universities are represented by players either in, going, or have been in the States. We all want to welcome back Aaron Jarvis, last year's and our defending champion who gave a great speech last night, and we were reminded that this year, is unique for Aaron because also in the field will be his brother, Andrew. So obviously we have the RNA Chief Executive, Martin Slumbers, and the Augusta National Chairman, Fred Ridley, with me here today. And I think I can say for all of us, we think three things about this championship. Number one, it's special. Number two, it brings us together and you together in a unique way. We appreciate what this means in terms of bringing us together, not just the athletes together. But number three, we're very grateful over the years for the incredible venues uh, that we've gotten to, uh, to host for this event. And probably just importantly, the, as my wife would say, she uses the term precious memories. 
there's been some real precious memories for us, our teams, and our families around these, and we're, and we're, uh, we're grateful for both. Um, so on the topic of great venues and precious memories, the three of us are excited to announce today that the 2024 playing of the Latin American Amateur Championship will be the Santa Maria Golf Club in Panama. I see a flag, so I feel like there's a photo coming soon. <laughs> For those of you who've been with us for eight years, you'll notice that this is our second time in Panama, although a new golf course in Santa Maria uh, opened in 2012, a uh, Jack Nicholas design with incredible skyline views of Panama City. So I think this will not only be a great experience for the athletes, but quite frankly, the three of us and our staffs are just as excited about that. I want to say a heartfelt congratulations to Santa Maria, um, to Panama Golf Association, on behalf of the three of our organizations, we're not only excited to work with you over the next 12 months, we're excited to work for you to bring the ninth championship to, uh, to your home. Lastly, I just want to say that um, the reason those 108 athletes were probably sleepless last night isn't just the first tee ball, but it's what this could mean if you're standing there on Sunday and the trophy is handed to you. We're proud of the opportunities that this championship creates. This year, our 2023 champion will be at the 2023 Masters Tournament. They'll be at the 2023 Open Championship, Royal Liverpool, correct? Mm -hmm. Incredible venue. And I'm proud to announce on behalf of the USJ that this year's champion will also be in Los Angeles for the 2023 United States Open. So imagine that champion at the end of Sunday. <laughs> No one ever accused the USGA of being fast to the draw, so I'm sorry if we were a little late to the party. <laughs> Obviously, we think that this reflects the strength of this field, the athletes that come out of that, and the opportunity to put them on a, on a grand stage as well, as well as my partners. The last thing I want to say is uh, not on any script. I just wanted to say it to you, which is uh, there's a lot of people around this, this, um, this great championship that you don't see. We get to sit up here and take credit for those great people, but don't miss as writers and storytellers, don't miss what happens in other parts of this business. There's 19 referees and officials here from 12 different regions. Um, we just learned this morning that there's a husband and wife referee crew, both from Puerto Rico. That's, that's fun for us as well. Whether it's course setup, operation, agronomy, communication, volunteers, all of them are leading by example. And what I mean by that is coming together, no matter where you're from, to put on a great championship, and to do it for a bigger purpose than whatever association you represented before you got off the plane. So to wrap up, let me just say on behalf of the three of us, welcome to Puerto Rico, have a great week, continue to tell these great stories because you really are making a difference, not only this week, but in a bunch of young kids that are gonna dream of being here someday. So thank you for what you do, thank you for being here this week, and thank you for covering this incredible championship. I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, and uh, two very positive announcements to begin the press conference with. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Okay, good to see you. No. <laughs> see? Hi, this is Fernando from Golf Channel Latin America. And my question is for Mr. Martin. Uh, obviously, last year Open was a very special one. Um, you saw it uh, closely with Aaron Jarvis being the first lag champion to play the weekend at the Open. So if, from your perspective, what was the most important thing or the most special thing Aaron experienced during his week at the, at the Open at St. Andrews? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for reminding me of that very special week last, last July. It does seem like an awful long time ago, though, now. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at why do we do this championship, we do this championship primarily to create pathways for the very best and to f give them the opportunity to see where they want to take their life. And um, I saw last year with Aaron that he turned up, he played some practice rounds. He played about a month or so before the, 
before the Open and the golf course looked very different. And I remember his uh, um, gentleman from uh, the, uh, the Cayman Islands said to me, he said, um, he thinks the golf course is, is, is playable in this area. And he said, but it's going to change in the next month. And I said, yeah, and most of the lines he hit today, he will not be able to hit in four weeks' time. Um, but he learnt, he learnt an awful lot, and he had that experience. He's had that opportunity to see where his game is and to see where he enjoys um, playing with the very, you know, the very best professionals that we have in the game. And uh, it made me really smile when he made the cut and played the weekend. And uh, it's, it's something that, you know, we talk about making the cut at our great championships, the majors. It is really hard to make the cut. It is really, really hard. And so any of these amateurs that actually do make the cut, kudos to them. And uh, I'm glad that he enjoyed the experience. And uh, you know, for, us, for us at the RNA, you know, he's part of our history now. OK, next question, please. To the far left there. Oh. <laughs> I'm passing the microphone on. I think it was back to the left hand side there, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Close. This is a question for um, all three, really. Um, can you speak a little bit about the decision making that went into choosing Puerto Rico as a venue? Um, and then maybe what you have learned about Puerto Rican golf uh, in the time since choosing it and in the preparation leading up to this weekend? I guess, Mike, would you like to, to say sure. a few words in Puerto Rico? Yeah, I think two things. One is uh, we have definitely tried and will continue to try to bring this championship around Latin America um, to be able to celebrate this in different regions. I think, um, if I'm being honest with you, the three of us know Sydney so well uh, that we feel like we know Puerto Rican golf uh, probably <laughs> better than we, when we did. The passion of the players we've met from here, both at this level and, and above, is, uh, uh, is easy to see. But when you come here, uh, it's... To me, you can always tell you're in a, in a fun country where you can strike up a conversation. I struck up one on the flight in, um, and, uh, and then having lunch my first day here about golf. And so it's, uh, it's exciting to me that it's exciting to the people here. Um, the fact that we have nine athletes from Puerto Rico in this event uh, says a lot. And again, if you're, if you're from America, in my case, and in, and in Chairman Ridley's case, um, we see this crossing borders as well. You know, there's just as many Latin American uh, uh, development programs going on in America as well. So, it's exciting for us to actually put it in play, and, and maybe we had a little bit of a head start at the USGA being here last year and already knowing both the, the quality of the golf course, the quality of the people that helped us put on the championship, and the excitement among the athletes that played. Okay, uh, next question, please. I mean, I have three questions maybe with the same theme, so I'm happy to take one at a time if there's other questions, but so I'll start with uh, Mr. Juan. So, if, since we are in Puerto Rico, um, I, I was wondering what, if you can describe, in, I mean, the, the work that the USGA has done with young players through first tee, through girls golf, in Hispanics, in the US, in Mexico, and in Puerto Rico, no? and yeah. how it ties up with this event. Uh, thank you for the question, and uh, yes, you're right. I mean, with First Tee here and in Mexico, girls golf program in Mexico, we just awarded um, quite a few grant programs, even in America, that were tied to Latina golf development programs, um, and helping those athletes not only build their game, but get to get to D1 uh, and scholarship opportunities. So um, again, our partnership with Sydney and the Puerto Rican Golf Association has helped us build a First Tee program here that's pretty impactful. I think uh, and with our Mexican Federation folks that are here as well, you see quite a, quite a program we've built in Mexico as well. Uh, and it's, uh, it's unique in the fact that a lot of times I'll be in a different country talking about the development program we're working on, but it doesn't cross back into the United States. In this case, definitely does. Um, and uh, while we're a significant contributor to First Tee and have been since day one, we've also recently added these what we call IDEA grants, which are really designed to, uh, to help programs go after a more diverse audience. And most of those idea grants have been tied around Latina golf development programs um, in some of the markets you'd guess and maybe in some of the markets you wouldn't. So it's, um, um, it's an honor. I mean, I think the three of us have unique jobs in the fact that we get a front row seat to see tomorrow's great golfers. And we get to see them at a lot of different ages. Uh, but to see them 
beginning, coming out of first tee programs, on their way to college, and then playing at events like this, it's, um, it's pretty special. My wife pointed that out to me one time, flying back from, uh, from an event like this, that you know, you, not many people get to see what the game looks like in 10 years. You, you all and we all are getting that opportunity this week, and it's pretty special. Yeah, sorry, just the last one for me. Um, this is, question is for Chairman Ridley. Um, here. Yeah, obviously we have very good memories about the Augusta National Women's Amateur with, with Maria Fassi in the first edition. And just want to ask you, how do you feel about the first two editions of the tournament? Uh, obviously a lot of talent from the region and playing this year too. Uh, if you can share your thoughts about that. Thank you. Well, I'm, I don't think any of, any, any of us will forget that inaugural event uh, with uh, Maria Fassi and Jennifer Cupcho. Um, it really turned, turned into almost a match play tournament with the two of them, particularly on the back nine, you know, a, a venue that's been famous for excitement uh, over the years of the Masters tournament. And, and the, uh, the quality of their play was unbelievable. But I think more than that, it was the sportsmanship that they showed uh, towards one another, and it was certainly a memory that uh, that I will never forget. Uh, but you know, the international uh, uh, contingency in the Augusta National Women's Amateur continues to grow, and and we certainly expect that will, will continue to happen. And we look forward to seeing uh, more women from Latin America, and I'm sure that's going to happen. Okay, next question, Center, yes. please. Yes. Hay 72 jugadores del field que representan. 72 jugadores del field que representan a 58 universidades de Estados Unidos en este torneo. ¿En qué medida se acortó esa brecha entre el golfista universitario y el jugador que termina siendo profesional e incluso convertirse en una estrella con distintas exenciones y, y caminos para llegar, para dar ese paso? ¿no? ¿En qué medida se facilitó? Gracias. Thank you. There are 72 sí. players. <laughs> There are 72 players here representing 58 colleges. So my question is, how does that uh, gap narrowed between the player that is uh, at the university and makes a uh, next step going into a professional golf? And um, if, you th if you think that that uh, gap has narrowed more now? Any more of us, sir? More. Like, so go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I think with the three of us have often talked about is the championship getting better? And when, certainly when I think about that, I'm not really looking at who wins or who's in the top three. It's how close are the bottom third to the top third. And I think we have definitely, I've done, this is my seventh, um, I've definitely seen that bottom level get better. And I'll be very interested to see this week whether that, has, that continues. And the only way you find out in any walk of life, and sport is no different, whether you are good enough to pursue your dream is to test yourself against the very best at each age level or each ability level. And that's what these young men are going to find out this week, whether they are able to move to the next level if they're not, it's not a bad, not a big deal. They're great players. They've had, got lots of things out of the game of golf, and they will find out um, where their future lies. And um, that's all the three of our organizations can do, which is create opportunity. Okay, thank you. Another question again? Yes, in the center? No? One? Hi. Um, John Paul Polo from Discover Puerto Rico. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all three of you for choosing Puerto Rico as a destination and allowing us to showcase our great golf product as well as our country. Um, in that vein, my question is, besides the amazing opportunity that this tournament gives to young players, um, how does the tournament like this and the appeal uh, that it has internationally, what type of impact does it have in the countries that is actually showcasing? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about when Mike, uh, who, by the way, certainly gave the longest opening statement in the history of this tournament, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but I would also say I think probably, probably the best because uh, 
uh, he certainly conveyed the enthusiasm of all three of our organizations for being, uh, being here in Puerto Rico. And, and I'd just like to start by saying that um, the enthusiasm and the passion that we've seen just this week since we've been here has been amazing. This country loves the game of golf, and it's really coming through. And I know I've had many discussions over the years with my friend Sidney Wolf about you know, the uh, desire and really uh, uh, just a burning desire to have, have this championship. And uh, so we knew that uh, when we came here, it was going to be successful. Um, but one of the things I was thinking, re reflecting back on Mike's statement, you know, he was thanking all of you for being here, and I certainly would reiterate that. But there's so many constituencies, you know, that make up a championship and make up, uh, you know, golf, a golf landscape in a country. And, and certainly you, the media, are a big part of it. But in addition to the players, I was thinking about, you know, all of the officials from around the, around the world that have come to help put on this championship. Uh, and, and really just what it does for the various golf organizations in the region to get together. So there are many synergies that are being created here. And I think that's a credit to this country. It's a credit to the region. Um, and that, to me, you know, is, is, is an additive factor to this championship and certainly uh, creating these pathways we've talked about for the players, but just really the entire golf ecosystem in the region is brought together. Uh, and I can't think of a better place to do it than here in Puerto Rico. Enter. So, so Mr. Slambers, so, um, based on your experience with the AAC and with the LAAC, you know, and, and kind of with junior golf globally, you know, in, I mean, one thing we find every year here, I think, is these kids or these young players all kind of share the same values and aspirations. No? So from your experience and your point of view, what those values and aspirations are? Um, you know, when I, when I talk about the great privilege I have being in this, in this role and being part of you know, the RNA and part of golf's history, um, I. I really reflect on what really matters to me and why do, why do I do the job. And I do it because I have a great love of golf. And I have a great love of golf because I think golf is probably unique in sport in that at its center is values. It's about integrity. It's about personal accountability. It's about friendship. And in a a sport which is a selfish sport in many, many ways because you play it on your own and often don't talk to anyone for four and a half hours, which actually is an enormous pleasure sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think that we, we forget. Mike very eloquently talked about you write stories. I would love you to write more stories about let's not forget why golf is great and why it is because it's the values of golf. That's why young people play the game. That's why it equips them for life, because those three skills, those three values are what you need, whatever you choose to do in the world is, as you get older. And, um, you know, I think that I would much rather see the dialogue, the conversation, the great writing to be more centered around how important our values to the game of golf and how important golf is to society, and how much I passionately believe that golf is part of the solution, it's not part of the problem. Mike, if I could, if I could just add yes. to that. Uh, yesterday, I had, the, uh, I had the privilege of meeting uh, a gentleman that I think all of you from Puerto Rico know. Uh, is this Jim Teal? Jim? Jim Teal. Uh, who was the founder of the Puerto Rican Golf Association in 1954. He's 100 years old. And uh, we were playing golf yesterday at uh, El Dorado, and uh, he came up while we were having lunch, and we spoke. Uh, clearly, uh, he was from the, uh, from the U.S. mainland, and I asked him you know, where he grew up, where he was from. He said he was from Minnesota. And, and uh, he said he went to... Uh, he was in the Navy in World War II, and uh, I told him my father was a B-17 pilot in World War II. And he said after spending two years in the Pacific, he came back to Minnesota. He said, I saw a lot of palm trees when I was in the Pacific with the Navy. <laughs> I came back to Minnesota for five years and figured I've got to get out of there. And he, he says, I wanted to look for a place that had palm trees and golf. And he said, I, I settled on Puerto Rico. 
And then he said, you know, you and I met once in 1976 at the World Amateur Golf Championship in Portugal. And I thought to myself, isn't this, to your point, Martin, isn't this a great game? Here's a gentleman who's from my father's generation who I met almost 50 years ago, and, and he remembered that. And here we are in 2023 having a conversation about the great game of golf here in this great country, Puerto Rico. And I just thought to me, to me, that's, that's, what, that's what golf's all about. Agreed. Okay, I think we have one final question. Time for one question sent to there, please. Sí. Buenos días. Eh, Carlos González, El Diario La Tercera de Chile. Eh, mi pregunta es para los tres. Eh, en estos tiempos tan, tan dinámicos y tan rápidos, eh, ¿cómo imaginan ustedes el, el golf amateur y el golf profesional en los próximos años? ¿Vislumbran algunos cambios? Eh, formato, etc. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo lo imaginan ustedes? My question is for all three of you. Um, with these changes and these dynamic days, how do you envision golf, both amateur or professional, in the coming years? I'll start because I think I'm on a time limit with the chairman, so I'll go quick as I can. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. That's not that good. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt if you look at this room, you look at this championship, and you think about what's going on with the game, that the game is just becoming more and more global, and that the lines in the globalness of this game are becoming more and more blurred. You know, we have a world handicapping system in 120 countries where people are playing by the same rules, same handicapping. I said this the other day at an ESPN conference, but try to get off a plane in Thailand, show up at a basketball court with two women, two men, two seniors, and play a quality basketball game. But we do that in golf every day and take it for granted that this game uh, brings, unites people uh, from all parts of the world, all different backgrounds, all different skill levels, all different passion levels, because the game can kind of catch you at different times in your life. So, uh, you know, when you think about where this game has been and where it is today, and you kind of chart, you, you chart that graph, um, the global expansion, the global togetherness, and the, you know, the blurriness between those lines is something that I think we can be excited. Our kids' kids will inherit a global game that, um, that maybe we could have envisioned when we were kids, but is, is becoming a reality right in front of us. Stop the clock. Well done, Mike. <laughs> no, I, I guess I would just add to that that, um, you know, 25 years ago, I'm, I'm not sure that a lot of us would envision you know, our three organizations sitting here at a table talking about an initiative such as the Latin American Amateur Championship or any initiative. Uh, and the fact that, you know, that, that our three organizations, along with many, many uh, regional organizations, country, uh, golf organizations from, country, from countries around the world, are working together like, like never before, I think, really bodes well for the, for the game. And I think that, um, you know, that these, the values that Martin talked about really are, are no one is in a better position than, than, the, than the, the organizations in the, in the game of golf to really promote those values. And, and hopefully that, uh, you know, when I, when I listened to Aaron last night, you know, and, and had a chance to speak with him one-on-one, -on -one, what, a, what a fine young man, what a great representative of this game. And I think that gives me a lot of heart. You know, despite a lot of the issues that are going on in the game, I'm very optimistic about our future. And I'm very optimistic and hopeful that players coming along today will realize that these opportunities have been provided by those who went before them. And that they will realize the responsibility to do the same for the next generation. That's what's going to be the key to the future of this game. And just, and just building on uh, you know, Fred's point about you know, the, we, we, the game we have is built on those who came before us. Uh, I'll, I'll leave one, one little quote about where do I think the game is is going to go, which is, uh, you know, Arnold Palmer. And quoting a little bit of the, the phrase he said, what do I think golf is? I think it's the greatest game mankind ever invented. And I'm very proud to be part of it. I think on that note, we'll draw the press conference to a close. Uh, thank you to our panel this morning, and thank you to everyone for attending. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.